might remember Ron Hamburg, a couple of you that was in that position back in when I got ordained in 95. Let's bow together and, and ask the Lord to guide us through this time. Oh Lord, we just thank you that we can be here in your house, that we can be with friends and family, and that we can worship you. And today, Lord, we just ask you to take charge of this service for your honor and for your glory. Amen. The first hymn is God Will Take Care of You. No, I'm Christ alone at first. Man, he switched it around on me. Yeah. It's not right. <laughs> it's in Christ alone, and the words will be up on the screen for the music.
message for the children at this time? So yeah, we're all adjusting, aren't we? We're not able to follow the hymns and we're working with the, We're doing that at Hustle Town too. So um, yeah, making all these adjustments, either you know, handing out songs or figuring out which verses and all that. But you know, we're just thankful to still be able to be together. So definitely, as believers, we need that fellowship, don't we? Um, so I'm going to be reading, if any kids want to come up, feel free. Oh, look, she's waiting. Good, good. <laughs> Anyone else want to come up here? So, yeah, you can sit there on the floor, whatever you'd like. How are you doing? You missing camp? You know what? We just had, and this kind of serves as an announcement as well. We just had a camp board meeting yesterday, and we decided we are having day camps here at the Fish Lake Chapel um, in August on the 10th and the 11th, which is a Monday and Tuesday. It's going to be teenagers, the teen camp, basically. And it'll be um, 9.30 to 5. And then Wednesday and Thursday, we're going to combine our junior and youth camps. So the 7 to 12-year-olds all get to come Wednesday and Thursday from 9.30 to 5. So we'll have lunch provided, and we're just going to be getting information out about that since our meeting just, um, that all got just decided last evening. So, so yay, we at least get, it won't be the same, but it'll at least be, we're going to, you know how creative pay is, right? And you Bartels all know. So, um, yes, and you know, back here we got another camper. Good, she's not on the floor, so I'll try not to embarrass her too much. <laughs> <laughs> so, you guys all know how creative Kay is, and she's so excited, and she's going to do all she can to make it like camp. So we're going to, you know, incorporate a lot of our camp activities and make it as much like camp as we can. So we'll be doing that. Um, for this message, though, um, Pastor Bruce is going to be talking about um, discouragement and encouragement. And where did I leave my other note? There it is. So I'm going to be reading, this is a... This scripture isn't part of the message, but this is what I'm using. Um, Matthew 13, 24 through 39, <clears throat> about the tares among the weeds. Do you know what a tear is? What? That is one kind of tear, and that's very good. Yep, that is spelled T E A R, and that's a tear. Like if I were to rip this page, it'd be like a tear, right? This kind of tear is spelled T A R E, and that um, is like a weed. And, and my Bible even has a footnote, um, and it calls it a weed resembling wheat. So keep that in mind as you hear these verses. I'm going to start at uh, Matthew 13, verse 24. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the name, or I'm sorry, in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares, and buy them in bundles to burn up, but gather the wheat into my barn. So a tear is kind of a weed. And I'm no master gardener. How many of you like to garden? <laughs> Quite a few, yep. Um, but definitely I find for myself that it's easier to identify the weeds once they get bigger. <laughs> and that's kind of what was going on here because these weeds, these tears, resemble the wheat. So if they pulled them up too early, they might have pulled out some of the wheat with it, pulled out the good seed, that kind of thing. Um, so um, life can be that way though too. Sometimes things in our lives and even people can be hard to initially distinguish between the good seed and the wheat. Sometimes, you know, we have to give things time. We have to 
build trust in people and see, okay, they say they're a Christian, but let's watch how they live, or things like that. And we have to see, and are they going to follow through with their word and things like that? And, and we can kind of give things time to see, to, to distinguish between the good seed and the wheat. So to tie it into Pastor Bruce's message, what are some weeds, and you can answer, or if anyone else also wants to answer, what are some things that are examples of weeds that can bring discouragement in our lives? <coughs> what kind of things bring discouragement? Peer pressure. Peer pressure, absolutely. How about COVID? Is that bringing some discouragement? <laughs> and all the regulations, right? Yeah? Movies. So I missed that one. Movies. Movies? They can, if they're not, yeah, if they're not uh, good ones. You know, I, I had the pleasure of going um, up into northern, northern Wisconsin with a couple of childhood friends the last couple of days um, up by Lake Superior. And it was so cool to hear how one of those friends, she watched the movie unplanned so that a movie like that was used in a really positive way. She had been pro-choice before watching that movie. And she shared with me how that totally changed her mind, and she now um, is pro-life. And, and she's, it was really, I'm getting goose, goose, holy ghost bumps thinking about just all the ways God has been working in her life and drawing, him, drawing her back to himself. So yes, but there are many weeds that we have to watch for in our lives. There are also things, though, that, that are like the wheat that bring us joy and bring us Closer to the Lord, what kinds of things would those be? Movies? Yes, just like a lens. So if you go, that's why we have to give it time, right? We have to discern which is the good seed or the bad. Yes, exactly. It can fall in either category. Peer what other pressure. things? Peer pressure. Peers? Peers can, exactly. So it can go either way, right? Yeah. So there's just, there's so many things like that in life that we have to just kind of watch. Okay, Lord, show us which are the weeds and and we have to be patient sometimes, you know, in, in identifying that. So, why don't I say a prayer and not get too long-winded, huh? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for um, this opportunity to be together today in your house and to worship you and to fellowship with our peers and with friends and family. And, and Lord, we thank you for your word and the truth in it and for how it helps us to learn and to grow. And, just help us, um, each of us in our lives, to identify the weeds, the tares, and the good seed around us, and to nurture those good seeds, and to continue to grow closer to you, and to shine and share, shine for you, and share your love with others. We just ask your blessing on the rest of this service in Jesus' name, Amen. Here you go. Thank you so much, Lori, for your words of prelude to the sermon. Yeah. I just want to say one thing about you and Lori, too, is the Camp Evergreen has been such, like Lori just said, it has brought so much for this little church bringing the kids there. It has made such a difference with the tears and everything else because I know of kids in my own family that it has helped so much to lead them to the Lord. So I just wanted to say thank you again. It's awesome to hear. Yeah, I'm sure it's quite a letdown that we aren't able to do camp. I mean, this camp's been going on for, I don't know, 60-some years, and this is the first time that something health-wise has prevented it from from going. But God speaks through camp. Kids love to come to camp and learn about Jesus, and that is really cool, especially in our day and age. The message I'm going to speak on is dealing with discouragement, and I'm going to be looking at Psalms 42 and 43. And um, in opening, I'm going to read a few of the verses. So um, if you want to follow along or just uh, listen, I'm going to start with chapter 42 and read 1 through 5. 
As the deer pants for streams of water, O oh, my soul pants for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. Will men say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of the Lord, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. And then let's look at chapter 43, uh, verses 1 through 4. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Rescue me from deceitful and wicked men. You are my stronghold. Why have you rejoiced in me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the heart, O God, my God. Obviously here as we, we look at this, the writer of the, these psalms was going through a tough time in their life. A time, a discouraging time, and, and we're going to be talking about that. But personally, you know, we have times of depression. I think that everybody can probably cite a time or tons that you've been depressed. And so we can all um, learn something from, from this. Um, and I'll preface this by saying um, some people have like a reactive depression, maybe it's to one situation that happened, the death or something. Um, some people have them that crop up throughout life, and some of us deal with it our whole life. And the Word of God does give us a help, and, and I'm not saying not to go to the doctor, I'm saying if, if you have discouragement that gets deep over a couple of weeks, maybe you should see your doctor and and try to um, see what's going on. But here's a, a situation where it's uh, some people, the sons of Korah, who are, are feeling this way. And, um, Korah was Aaron's son, so we have the sons of Korah, which would be the grandchildren of Aaron, and the great nieces and nephews of Moses. And originally, Korah was one of these that rebelled greatly. And reading the, the background on these people, we see that they were disobedient. And so God judged them. And 250 of them died by fire and swallowed up in the ground. And But yet, some of these survived. And they became strong. And they started really following God. And so the, the line did not die out, it continued. And as we follow that along, we get to where we are. So these descendants were not able to go up into the house of God, to Jerusalem. They missed their opportunity for worship. Was, were Sundays the same when we couldn't come to church? No, it was really strange. And we did, we recorded ours different spots, and then we, the first one we did back in church, we just had our song leader there, and just having one person inside the church with us felt really, really good. It felt like this is home, just one person. And so it's great to be back together again. <clears throat> but these people, they have loss, and depression can come up when there's loss. They lost their temple worship, they lost their jobs. They lost um, their ministry they were doing. They lost their home. And basically, they were forced to move. Moving is not fun, but being forced to move must be even, even worse. And these psalms go so well together that many think they were originally one psalm. Let's look at our, our first point. Reevaluating your situation. I won't read verses 1 through 3 because I just read them, but chapter 40, 
2, we're going to read verses 9 and 10 and add them into this. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony, as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? So his foes, his enemies were saying, you know, you got problems, why doesn't God just snap his fingers and, and fix this? And you're back home in Jerusalem, and we want him to do that a lot, don't we just snap his fingers? Um, but these things at that time, I don't know how they were dealing with God for sure, but sometimes discouragement can be spiritual in nature, and it can get very bad, as it said in, in verse 3. Here's a person greatly depressed, probably had a very hard time eating and sleeping. My tears have been my food. And it says, these things I remember, verse 4, as I pull, I pour out my soul to you. So he, he's at least thinking about it. Sometimes you can't even get the, to the place where you can think about it. No doubt this person had a hard time sleeping in the midst of all this. But discouraging things can, can get us spiritually too. Um, the soul does long for God. Um, sometimes we might not feel that God is real close to us. And sometimes we think he's not hearing our prayers. Or maybe it's something to do with us. Maybe there's unconfessed sin in our lives that can bring discouragement. And I say that not for us to point fingers at anybody and say that's why they're down. You know, it's about self-reflection. Maybe there's anger inside of their hearts. We don't know for sure. But it's good to reevaluate your situation and see um, if those downtimes actually reveal the emptiness of life and our longing to know God. And evaluate that and get back on the right track. The serenity prayer fits so well with this. God, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. There are sometimes there are things we can do about certain situations, and sometimes there isn't. And some, some people may want to try to talk us into some easy answers, and if you take this or that, or you do this or that, you'll never be depressed again in your life. And it doesn't go that way. But it's apparent that there's discouragement, depression, and it's the enemy. It's the foe. It's Satan working within people, mocking these people. Even if you cannot point, pinpoint reasons for discouragement or, or lost feelings, let your feelings be made known to God. And it doesn't have to be elaborate. Cry out to God, and he will hear you. God doesn't leave the psalmist here in despair. There are good things that happen. Secondly, let's talk about remembering your past. Remember your past. This is something that is very important. And in, in the deep depth of depression, a lot of times we're unable to do this. But it's a really good practice to do. Remembering the past can have both positive and negative elements. Um, verse 6 says, um, I'm going to add that on, I read verse 4 already, but verse 6 of Psalm 42 says, My God, my soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. So, remembering Remember when you were going through a tough time and how God helped you with, through it. Remember a time that you didn't know what was coming up next. When you were just totally, totally, the, the body chemicals were stopping you in your tracks. You were tired. You were irritable, but you couldn't sleep. You didn't want to eat. Remember back 
how things were. Now the writer remembered as he poured out his soul to God that he used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God. With shouts of jo excuse me, joy and thanksgiving, they came in festive throng to Jerusalem. And he was so filled with joy each time that happened. I'll bet the first Sunday you came back, you were filled with joy to be able to be together with each other in the house of the Lord. There's nothing like it. Maybe you need to go back in your mind and think about your salvation experience, how Jesus came into your life, how he died on the cross for you, and what he saved you from. That can be very helpful. Um, pouring out our soul to him can be very helpful. Some people get a lot of um, help with discouragement from listening to music. Now, in our day and age, there are just countless types of Christian music. Back when I was a kid, it was hymns, period. When I got to college, it was hymns plus about two other groups, and one was very controversial. Nowadays, you've got people doing all different styles of music, and it glorifies God. You have to use your style. Martin Luther got a lot of effect on his soil, soul by listening to music, and that really lifted him up. He, he went through depression, too. Use your style, use your volume, and use your time wishes. How, how much do you want to have that? You know, for some people, it could be all day long, and for others, maybe a half hour. And then also, um, talk to fellow believers. Do not forsake fellowshipping with others. Um, think about the struggles you had in the past and how he brought you through them. And remember, he will again. He keeps his word. Thirdly, we want to reclaim our hope. Now take a look at this. I've got them all blocked off in my Bible. Verse 5, verse 11, and then chapter 43, verse 5 are identical. Three times in the course of two psalms, these exact things are saying, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, and my God. Now parents, when you really wanted to get something through to your kid, you wouldn't just say it once. You might say it a couple times, and then as they're walking away, you might say it in another way. Now, here, the psalmist repeats something, and, and I think when it's repeated, it's very, very important. You know, not just twice, but there's three times where it says that, and, and how the lessons we can learn from that response. We must give over our hurts and pains fully to God and hope and trust in Him. And when we allow ourselves to do that and to no longer feel like victims, we put our hope in Him. The one and only solid thing and hope we have is God, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for our sins. All this other stuff can change in a second. And we've seen our world change really fast in our country, in our state, very, very fast. But Jesus never fails. God keeps his promises. And that's something that we can totally, totally count on. It's not going to be subject to change like many other things are. Some people do live on artificial hopes. A lot of people have some kind of hope that they base it on something different, something not solid. Maybe it's good looks, a big salary job, or a good family, or education. All these things can vanish soon. They're just temporary. They disappear. Hope usually goes with them. The late John McCain, as we have heard, he in, was in Vietnam, a prison camp during the Vietnam War. And 
people studied what he went through, and they came to the conclusion, if you have hope, you're able to cope. And he used to tell this story. He said, this was a horrible experience. In the final years of the American imprisonment in Vietnam, the North Vietnamese moved our soldiers from a small cell with one or two prisoners to large rooms with as many as 30 to 40 soldiers to a room. The soldiers preferred the situation for the companionship and strength they could draw from each other. They were also allowed time to receive packages and letters from home. Many men received word from their families for the first time in several years. In one of those cells was Navy officer Lieutenant Commander Mike Christian. Over a period of time, Mike gathered bits and pieces of red and white cloth from various packages that, that came. And he shaped a, a needle, a sewing needle, out of a piece of bamboo, and he sewed together on the inside of his prison shirt, a flag of the United States of America. So every night in their cell, he would take his shirt off, hang it on the wall, and they will put all the Pledge of Allegiance to that flag. It went on for some time, but they got caught in the middle of it. And the guards came in, they ripped the flag off the wall, ruined it, they dragged Mike out of the cell, and he was beaten for several hours, and then thrown back on the floor in the cell. McCain says, later that night, as the prisoners were settling down to sleep on the concrete slabs that we call beds, under the solitary light bulb hanging from the ceiling, here was Mike laying on the floor. Still bloody, his face was swollen beyond recognition, but Mike was gathering bits and pieces of cloth together and starting to work on a new American flag. That hope is what saw them through. And a soldier who had that deep hope in their hearts were, were held for. Now we have something really worth fighting for, no matter what, and that is for, for God. He is the creator of all the universe. You might think you need this or that, or, or people tell you you need this or that, but the person who made the universe is on your side. And prayer is relational. The psalmist kind of tells us here how to pray when we're, we're down. And here are some helps. Three, three things I'm going to quickly go through. First of all, pray from your heart. Look at verse 8 of chapter 42. The first part says, By day the Lord directs his love. At night his son is with me. Pray from your heart. Make sure he's on your heart and your mind. Secondly, pray humbly. The rest of that verse says, A prayer to the God of my life. We need to humble ourselves before God. And then thirdly, pray, be honest about it. In verses 9 and 10 talk about that. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony, as my foes taught me, saying all day long, where is your God? He needs to hear from you. Yes, he knows everything. But he needs to hear from you what you're going through and be honest about that before God. And we can be honest without being disrespectful to God. And fourthly, review God's truths. Review God's truths. And for this, we jump to our chapter 43, and I'm going to read verses 3 through 5. Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mount, to the place where you dwell. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the heart, O God, my God. And then he gets into this repeated, why are you downcast, O my soul? 
focusing on the truth that you know of God's Word, even if you're doubting, maybe there's certain things that you can focus on that would help. And, um, this psalmist said what he felt, but he did not give, on God, give up on God. Maybe people around him were, but he did not, they did not give up on what God did. God wants to be with us when everything fizzles over on us, when it's just a big, great big mess. He wants to have us to trust him at those times. When the fog seems to not lift from your life, maybe God <laughs> wants to do something special through you. Pay attention to your thoughts. Pay attention to the Word of God. Seek out Christ in everything that you say and that you do. So important to stay in the Word, in the Scripture. One of the easiest things to get busy and skip is devotional time. Make it a priority. It comes before anything else. When you get the Word of God inside of you, it assures you of His love, His greatness, and we can come before him and ask the same question that the, the psalmist did here. We're, but we're still going to heaven, and we're still knowing that God is alive. I don't know about you, but it's easy for me to, to forget God when times are rough. And that'll be something that we'll be working on for the rest of our lives. So in conclusion, when you turn in one of those down times, Look to God. He's able to do something about it. He's faithful to you in the past. He will be today, and he will be in the future. Because our God is great and awesome. Remember him. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, I thank you for the promises of your word. And I thank you for helping us to see through the processing of these two psalms that there is hope and there is life, and that you will be with us, that you'll guide us, you'll direct us in all things. Help us to remember to put you first. In Jesus' name, amen. How do you work offering here? We have a plate in the back. There's a plate in the back you know, on a chair there. So don't forget that on your way out. Um, let's turn to it or I'll turn to number 333, Living for Jesus. I'll just go down there. <laughs>
may be seated.